Amen. Amen. All right. Tonight is actually going to be the beginning of a series that we are starting. And the title of the series is going to be Obeying Authority. Obeying Authority. Now, throughout uh, the different parts of this series, we're going to go through the different institutions of authorities that exist. So there are legitimate types of authority, different institutions that God has granted or people that have been granted authority by God and it is legitimate and we are commanded to obey it and to recognize these types of authority. So what we'll be doing is I'll be dedicating uh, you know, uh, the Sunday evening service to one of these types of Authorities will go through and we will study them. We'll see the boundaries of these authorities. We'll see the ins and the outs. We'll see you know, what their scope of authority is, the purpose of this authority, how it corresponds with other types of authorities, how they all correspond with one another. And we will study God's Word and figure out as a Christian how we are supposed to react and how we are supposed to respond ourselves to these different types of Authorities. This is going to be part one. I do not have an introduction for uh, this particular series. I don't believe that I need one. But this is going to be this evening part one for the series Obeying Authority. And the title of this evening's uh, uh, part or series is going to be The Lord of Lords. The Lord of Lords. Now, I want to begin by defining the word authority. That's the very first thing that I want to do for you this evening is define the word authority. And I just took the first definition of Merriam-Webster's dictionary. It's a basic, very basic definition, very simple and easy. And it says this, the power or right to give orders, make decisions, and enforce obedience. I want you to turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter number 15. Keep your hand there if you haven't already dropped it. Keep your hand there uh, in 1 Chronicles. And I want you to turn with me to 1 Corinthians 15. So we're going to see that the Bible actually gives us, and we're going to notice this a few different times tonight, but the Bible actually gives us also a definition of the word authority. 1 Corinthians chapter number 15, I want you to look with me at verse number 24. The Bible says this, Then cometh the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father. Then it says this, When he shall have put down all rule, and all authority and power. So we can get an idea here. We can actually get a definition. It's the same exact definition that we get from a modern day dictionary of what the word authority means. You have two synonymous words that are used there with the word authority. Number one is the word power. That's probably the best definition, power. But also we see the word rule, the word rule. So we see that the definition of the word authority is power. And like I said, this, this is actually consistent with our modern day you know, definition of the word authority. I want you to go back with me to 1 Chronicles chapter number 29 now, please. 1 Chronicles chapter number 29. Uh, as I've mentioned already, and something I want to repeat at this point, is that there are different systems of power and there are dis different systems of authority. We can refer to these systems of authority as governments. They are governments. Government is just something that has authority. That's all that it is. It doesn't have to be referring to a state instituted government, right? A government is anything that has authority, any, any institution that has authority. And what I'm going to be preaching about tonight is the Lord of Lords. So of all these authorities, they're in different tiers. But there is an authority that is at the very top. There is an ultimate authority or there is a supreme authority and that is the Lord. That is why he's referred to as the Lord of Lords. I want you to look with me here at 1 Chronicles chapter number 29. Look at verse number 10. The Bible says this, Wherefore David blessed the Lord before all the congregation. And David said, Blessed be thou, Lord, God of Israel, our Father, forever and ever. Now, verse number 11, I want you to pay close attention. He says this, Thine, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. Now, watch this. For all that is in the heaven and in the earth is thine. Thine is the kingdom, O Lord, and thou art exalted as head above all. 
So the main point that I'm going to be getting across tonight, and you can consider this, if you will, to be the introduction to the series. The main point that I'm going to be getting across tonight is that there are different institutions of authority. There are different types of authority that exist, and they are legitimate. We're going to be going through the legitimate authorities that God has ordained in this world. But the first and foremost thing that we must recognize is that there is an authority above all other authorities. That there is an authority at the top and that it is God. It is the Lord. It is the creator of all and everything is His. I want you to notice a couple of phrases that are used there. It says this, For all that is in the heaven and in the earth is thine. Saying He is the possessor, He is the ruler of all things. Then it goes on to say this, Thine is the kingdom. And who is the head of a kingdom? The king. God is the king of all. He is the ruler of all. Then it goes on and says this. Notice this. O Lord, and thou art exalted as head above all. Everyone that has any power today or any man that has possessed any power at any time throughout history, God was always their head. In any situation, God always had authority over that man and he was always the ruler of that man. Over and over again, we'll see God referred to as the Lord of Lords throughout the Bible. I want you to go with me to 1 uh, Corinthians, excuse me, 1 Corinthians chapter number 11, verse number 1. We're going to see this in a couple of different areas where God is the ruler over other rulers. He is the ruler over other bosses. We need to understand also, it's important to understand what the word God means or what the word Lord means. And it's very basic. It just means ruler. That's what Lord means. It just means ruler. A Lord is someone that rules. It's someone that has power or has authority. Uh, it's so basic as a landlord. So that person rules that land. That property is theirs. Therefore, they have the right and the power over that property. That's all that that means. They are the boss of that property. We have a landlord here and she is the boss of this property. She owns this property and she rightfully has the power over this property, right? So that's all that it means. It just means a ruler or it means a, a possessor of power, if you will. That's what God and Lord both mean. That's what they mean. It means the same thing as king. So look here at 1 Corinthians chapter number 11, verse number 1. The Bible says this, Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. Now I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things and keep the ordinances as I delivered them to you. Verse 3. But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. So right here we actually can see a tier structure of authority. And the Bible says here that First off, the head of every man is Christ. So the ruler of every man, the Bible teaches, is Christ. That Christ, Jesus Christ, the man Christ Jesus is the ruler of every man. He is the head of every man. Then it says this, and the head of the woman is the man. So the man is the ruler of the woman. The man is the boss of the woman. Then it goes on and says this, and the head of Christ is God. So that speaking of the man Christ Jesus, the Bible says that the, the head of Christ is God. Now, of course, Christ was God manifest in the flesh, but he was truly and legitimately a man. And you know what he did? He came to this earth and was born on this earth as a man. He was 100% God and 100% man, but you know what he did? He lived as a man. And he was subject unto God while he was on this earth. I want you to go to Romans chapter number 13, verse number 1. So who was at the top of the tier there? Who was on the top tier there? We see woman, we see man, we see Christ, and then we see God. So notice God is at the top. He, as it says there in 1 Chronicles 29, is the head above all. He has the power. All things are His. There is no system of government that is equal unto or above God. God is above all government, all power. Any power that exists, exists only because God allows it or God ordained it. Look at Romans chapter number 13, verse number 1. This is very, very generally speaking, this is the perfect verse to show you this, of any sorts of power, whether it be government or anything or even the power that man has in uh, the relationship of marriage. Look at Romans chapter, number th Romans chapter number 13, verse number 1. The Bible says this, Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. So notice there are powers, plural. There are multiple types of governments or multiple types of authorities, right? Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. 
For there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. So notice that. I want you to notice a couple of things. Number one, again, it says that there are higher powers. So there are different institutions of power or institutions of government or authority, right? Different types of authority that exist. Then it goes on to say, for there is no power but of God. So the powers that, 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 that are on this earth, the Bible goes on to say, the powers that are, I'm sorry, the powers that be are ordained of God. So the Bible's teaching that anyone that has power only has it because God ordained it or because God put it into place. He implemented that type of system, if you will. So any power that anyone possesses, it's because God gave that, that power to them. Because He is the source of power. He is the supreme ruler of all things. And this is the very first thing that we have to understand when we start to discuss, when we start to think about authority in this world. If we start to think about power in this world, we have to understand that any power that does exist is below God. Any power that is here and that is present or anyone that has any authority their authority is under God. And the only way in which someone can have a legitimate authority or a legitimate power is because God ordained it and God allowed it. I want you to uh, turn to Deuteronomy chapter number 10, verse number 17, and we'll see this concept uh, a couple of more times here. I'm going to read to you from Joshua chapter 22. Joshua chapter number 22, verse number 22 says this, The Lord God of gods, the Lord God of gods, He knoweth, and Israel he shall know, if it be in rebellion or in transgression against the Lord. Uh, save us not this day, and then so forth and so forth. I want you to go to Deuteronomy chapter number 10, verse number 17. As I said, the Bible says in Deuteronomy uh, 10, 17, For the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, a great God, a mighty and a terrible, which regardeth not persons, nor taketh rewards. So notice there, over and over again, we're taught that He is the God of gods. He is the Lord of lords. What does that mean? That He is the rulers of all, ruler of all other rulers. Anyone that possesses power, God is their boss. Anyone that has any sort of you know, uh, authority, there's, they have an authority above them, and that is God. So we need to start off by recognizing the supreme authority. If we're going to talk about authority, if we're going to talk about power and governments, we need to understand that there is a supreme authority above all else. That there is a supreme and ultimate authority at the very top. I want you to also turn with me to Ephesians chapter number 1. Ephesians chapter number 1. And I'm going to read to you from Matthew chapter number 28, verse number 18. So a moment ago I alluded to the fact that, that Christ was God in the flesh. What happened was God set forth a plan to redeem all of mankind. And that was that He would come and become a man. He would be, you know, uh, come and uh, uh, become incarnate. He would come in the flesh. And what he, what he had done was He ordained and had this plan from the foundation of the world that he as a man was going to bring all of mankind unto himself. And he ordained that he would give all things into the hands of that man, the man Christ Jesus. So all power and all authority that exists, it's in the hands of the man Christ Jesus. The man Christ Jesus is the Lord of lords and the God of gods. He is the King of kings because that one true God became a man and he ordained that he was going to give all of that authority to himself as a man. I want you to look at, well you're in Ephesians 1.20, listen to Matthew chapter 28 verse number 18 after Jesus Christ's ascension he returned back and, uh, and spoke with his disciples and it says this, and Jesus came and spake unto them saying, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. So notice that he said, all power is given unto me in heaven and in in earth. You remember what 1 Chronicles chapter number 29 said? It said, For all that is in the heaven and in the earth is thine. Well, Christ shows up here, and you know what he says? All, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. 1 Peter chapter number 3, verse number 22 says this: Who is gone into heaven, speaking of Christ, who is gone into heaven and is on the right hand of God, angels and and authorities and powers being made subject unto him. I want you to look at Ephesians chapter number 1, verse number 20. Ephesians chapter number 1, verse number 20 says this, which he wrought in Christ 
Wrought is like work, past tense of work, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion. So it's just rewording the same thing over and over again and it says, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named. Not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. Verse 22, And hath put all things under his feet, and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Now I want you to notice there that the Lord Jesus Christ is set far above all principality and power and might and dominion. He is at the top. The Lord Jesus Christ is set above any power and any authority and any dominion or might that exists in this world and also in the world to come. So the one that we acknowledge as the supreme ruler, sp sp I'm excuse me, specifically, we refer to him as the Lord Jesus Christ. That is the supreme ruler. That is the God that was being referred to in 1 Chronicles chapter number 29. He is the supreme ruler. He is the ultimate ruler. He is the God of gods. He is the Lord of lords. 1 Timothy chapter number 6 verse number 14 says this, that thou keep this commandment without spot, unrebukable until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which in his times he shall show who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords. So right there it says, which in his times he shall show who is the blessed, and then it says this, and only potentate. Potentate refers to the word power. That's what that means. When something is potent, that means that it is powerful, right? That's what the word potent means. Man, if you try something, maybe some sort of recipe or something, and, and someone says you know, that that's too potent, what they're saying is that's too strong. That's too powerful. That's what the word potent means, or a potentate specifically is a ruler that has power. And right here it says that Jesus is going to show who is the blessed and only potentate. He's the only potentate. Now, if you think that there's this other person other than... I've said this a hundred times, but people just don't get it. If you think that there's this other person other than Jesus that is like also a potentate, you have a major, major problem. Right. You have a serious problem in the Bible. The Bible says that Jesus is the blessed and only potentate. There is no other potentate. There is no other power. There is no other strength or might or dominion that exists outside of Jesus Christ. He is the ultimate ruler. He is the supreme authority and power. So when we recognize who that Lord is, that is Lord of Lords, we need to understand that it is Jesus Christ. That is who has all power and all authority and all might. Amen. Revelation chapter 17 verse number 14 says this, These shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them. For He is Lord of lords and King of kings, and they that are with Him are called and chosen and faithful. Notice that. For He, that's the Lamb, is Lord of lords and King of kings. Kings. It also says this in Revelation 19, 16. And this is actually the prophecy that 1 Timothy 6 is referring to. Revelation 19, 16, when Christ comes back, it says this, And he, that's Jesus, hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. The God of God, God's the Lord of lords, the King of kings that's spoken of in the Old Testament, the supreme ruler is the Lord Jesus Christ. He is at the top. So there are different tiers of authority. There are different institutions that have authority. There are all these different systems and they are legitimate that God has set up. You know, the man, of course, over the woman, over the household, over the family. And then, of course, we have the church, you could say, the local church. You have the, you know, in the Old Testament, you had the temple with the priests. Not only that, the state of government as well. This, it, these are legitimate areas of authority. But do you know over all of these different authority structures, there's an authority at the top, and it's God. There's authority at the top, and it's the King of kings and Lord of lords. It is the Lord Jesus Christ.
Now, I want you to go to Acts chapter number 5, verse number 27. So once we, we uh, uh, start here, you know, the subject of obeying authority, we need to first understand who is the top authority. And I'll tell you why that's extremely important. In the United States, we have a law that is called the Supremacy Clause. Is anyone familiar with what this is? The Supremacy Clause. Well, supremacy is like, comes from the word supreme, right? The Supremacy Clause. And this, is, this law is basically null and void today, and that'll be humorous to you in a moment. But what the Supremacy Clause is, it is a constitutional law that was uh, you know, signed in accordance with the Constitution later. It was passed. And what it means is that the Constitution is the law of the land. That's what it means. And furthermore, it means this, that the federal government... Uh, you, so you have the Constitution, but also you have laws that the federal government will pass when an issue comes up. They will examine what's going on, and there will be you know, Supreme Court rulings at times. And the only way in which they can pass those laws is if they are in, in pursuant with the Constitution, right? If, they, if they, they are in accordance with the Constitution and they jive with our Constitution, you know, uh, God-given rights, right? Now, that law, those laws are federal laws. You know, our country is made up, uh, it's of course the United States of America. So our country is made up of also individual states, right? And, and uh, you know, there are, there are uh, different laws that the states will have themselves, right? There are different laws that the states will pass. Now the Supremacy Clause, what that does is, the Supremacy Clause is an explanation of what to do in the case when you have a conflict between a federal law and a state law. If, a, if the state passes a law that contradicts the Constitution or something spe more specifically, if it, con if it conflicts with or contradicts the Bill of Rights, which do you go with? You go with the federal law, which is the Bill of Rights. So the state law that conflicts with the Bill of Rights would be out the door. That's basically what that means. There is a supremacy clause. So the law of the land, the supreme law of the land is the Bill of Rights and federal laws that are passed in accordance with the Bill of Rights. And there are times when states will pass laws that contradict the Bill of Rights. And when that happens, and you have to make a decision on which you're going to keep, you are supposed to keep the federal laws, or you're supposed to keep the Bill of Rights. So that's why if a police officer, or whoever it may be that is in power, authority, you know, they swear an oath to that they're going to follow the Constitution with their, the, the responsibilities and the duties that they have, and sometimes when they are ignorant of what the Bill of Rights actually teaches, they actually, by keeping their state laws... And, and all of these other ordinances that have been passed, they are sometimes violating the Constitution or violating the Bill of Rights. Now, what should happen there? Should we throw out the Bill of Rights or should we throw out the ordinances and the state laws that contradict the Bill of Rights? We should, of course, throw out the state laws that contradict the Bill of Rights. This is what's known as the Supremacy Clause. And what is the purpose of it? It is establishing tiers of authority. And that there is a higher authority, and it is, in this case, in the United States of America, it would be considered the Bill of Rights is the highest authority. That is what is supposed to constitute, that's what, you know, it means the Constitution is what makes up what we believe, right? So the Bill of Rights is supposed to be our laws that we abide by in the United States of America. And all of the, all of the states, they have the authority to pass laws, of course. But they are not supposed to pass laws that are contradicting the Bill of Rights, which is the supreme law of the land. Now, that same concept is taught in the Bible. That exact same concept. Because God has ordained uh, different powers also, hasn't He? God has ordained different governments. Just like you, you know, there are state government, governments and there are federal governments. If we look at the United States, we have the federal government, then there's also, also multiple state governments. Well, in, in the Bible, you know, the Bible teaches that there are legitimate governments. As I, I mentioned just a moment ago, right? There is, you know, the, the authority that the man has. There is the authority at the church. There is the authority at the temple in the Old Testament. There is the authority of state governments. But then also there is God as the governor at the top. And we need to understand the supremacy clause when it comes to this. 
I want you to look at Acts chapter number 5, verse number 27. This same concept is being taught here. Acts chapter number 5, verse number 27, it says this, And when they had brought them, they set them before the council, and the high priest asked them, saying, Did not we straightly command you that you should not teach in this name? Now let me stop you real quick. This is the high priest and all the priests and all of them from the, the temple and the synagogue. Do they have a God-given authority? They do, in a sense, don't they? They have a real authority that God granted unto them. The priests are referred to as rulers time and time again. These men had authority, didn't they? And what did they say? They said, we commanded you. We, we, we gave you a law, if you will, right? We passed the law, or we commanded you, it says, that you should not teach in this name. And then it goes on, it says, And behold, ye have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. Now look at verse number 29. It says this, Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. Amen. So I want you to notice what Peter said here. Now there is a legitimate authority that was given to the priests. But when the priest stepped outside of his bounds and started trying to pass a command or pass a law that contradicted the Lord's law or the Lord's command, notice that the supremacy clause kicked into play, didn't it? And Peter and all the apostles understood who was the supreme authority and who was the supreme ruler. If there is ever a contradiction with man's law and God's law, we always go with God's law. It it doesn't matter what we have to lose. It doesn't matter what situation we are put in. It doesn't matter if we're facing persecution like the apostles were in the book of Acts here. We always go with God's law. He is the supreme ruler and there is no law and there is no command that can ever trump his law or his command. Right. Those same priests and all of the Pharisees, they did the exact opposite. I want you to go with me to Mark chapter number 7. Mark chapter number 7. <clears throat> Mark chapter number 7 and we're going to begin reading the beginning of the chapter verse number 1 the Bible says this then came together unto him the Pharisees and certain of the scribes which came from Jerusalem and when they saw some of his disciples eat bread with defiled that is to say with unwashed hands they found fault for the Pharisees and all the Jews except they washed their hands off eat not, holding the tradition of the elders. And when they come from the market, except they wash, they eat not. And many other things there be which they have received to hold, as the washing of cups and pots, brazen vessels and of tables. <clears throat> then the Pharisees and scribes asked him, Why walk not thy disciples according to the tradition of the elders, but eat bread with unwashed hands? He answered and said unto them, well hath Isaiah prophesied of you, hypocrites, as it is written, This people honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Howbeit in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. For laying aside the commandment of God, ye hold the tradition of men as the washing of pots and cups and many other such like things ye do. And he said unto them, Full well ye, watch this, reject the commandment of God that ye may keep your own tradition. For Moses said, Honor thy father and thy mother, and whoso curseth father or mother, let him die the death. Now that's God's law. That's God's command. That is a supreme law that cannot be made null and void. I want you to look now at verse number 11. It says this, But ye say, if a man shall say to his father or mother, <clears throat> it is korban, that is to say, a gift, by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me, he shall be free. And ye suffer him no more to do aught for his father or his mother. Verse 13, making the word of God of none effect through your tradition which ye have delivered. And many such and um, excuse me, <clears throat> and many such like things do ye. So I want you to notice that the Pharisees and the scribes did the exact opposite of the apostles. They had their own laws, they had their own commands, and it says that they teach them as commands. Their doctrines they were teaching as commandments. So they had their own laws and their own commandments that they were ordering people 
that they had to keep. Now, many of the Pharisees were also priests and they had their own power and authority, just like the scribes are a part of this same group. And they were of the uh, tribe of Levi. So they had a legitimate authority in a sense. They had this legitimate authority. What they were doing was they were passing laws and they were passing commandments that contradicted God's law. They were passing commandments that caused people to disobey God's law. And what did Jesus say that they should have done? Well, it's really clear because he's rebuking them and calling them a hypocrite. And he's saying that they are supposedly... Here, they, you know, supposedly they act like they are worshiping God. Because what do they say? It says that they, they honor him with their lips, but their heart is far from him. So what they're doing is they're passing these laws and they're causing people to disobey. By keeping their laws and their commands, they're causing people to disobey a high, an even higher power than them. Which is the, the, the power and authority above all. Who is he that is head above all, and that is God, that is the ruler and the authority of all. So if there are any laws that contradict God's law, God's law always takes precedence every single time. If there is a commandment or a law that is passed, and in order to still keep God's law, you must disobey that law of man, then you disobey it. If man's law ever contradicts or, you know, uh, and by keeping it would cause you to be disobedient to God's law, then you disobey man's law. You always make sure that you keep God's law. He is the supreme ruler and the supreme authority. <clears throat> he is the God of the universe. And I want you to think about this as well. The universe is also run by laws, isn't it? Our universe, our natural and physical you know, universe that we live in is ran by laws. And you know, mankind through you know, trial and, and different you know, trial and error and through experience and all different types of, of you know, circumstances and scenarios, man has you know, discovered different laws that exist in this universe, right? In this, when we look at our physical universe, there are all different types of, of natural laws, scientific laws that exist, real laws that cannot be broken. You know, you have the first and second law of thermodynamics. You have the, you know, you have the law, uh, you know, of inertia. You have all different types of law of momentum, all different types of, of laws that exist. And in order to have laws, you know what you have to have? You have to have a law giver. You know, you can really look around when you see these laws, the law of gravity. You think about how this cannot be defied. You know, just a powerful law like the law of gravity in the universe. You, you know, how there's just this perfect order in the world. It shows you the power that God really possesses as a ruler. I want you to go to Deuteronomy chapter number 31 verse number 27. And when we look at the laws in the universe, what's the purpose for the laws in the universe? It is, as I said, to keep order. That's the purpose. There's a, there are laws in this universe and the purpose of all of the scientific laws, all of the naturalistic laws, is to keep order in this universe. Well, that's the same reason why God gives us laws. It's so that we have order in our lives. So that we do things right and in order. And Christianity is supposed to be a religion of humility. It is a religion of humility. It is a religion of service and ministry. It is, it is very different than many other religions. It is a religion of, of humility, a religion of service, and a religion of ministry. And it is not a religion of rebellion. Christianity is not a religion that teaches this, a, a, a spirit of rebellion where we should be a rebellious type of people. It's exactly the opposite. Now, are there times to rebel against laws? Of course, if it defies God's law. You know, just like there, you know, someone may look at when uh, the Peter and the other apostles were defying the high priest, and they may say, man, that's rebellious. But they actually weren't rebelling. They were be being obedient to the highest power that exists, and that's God. They were actually showing humility and obedience to him who actually deserved obedience. What was going on with there was that a lower power and a lower authority was defying God and trying to teach other people to do also. They were trying to compel them and teach them to be disobedient to the laws that God had given. That's actually causing disorder. You know, if we follow God's law, it will bring about order and it will bring about peace. 
Rebellion, the spirit of, of, of uh, rebellion and a person being rebellious always comes from a prideful person. But Christianity teaches us to be humble. And in order to be obedient, and in, and, and in order to you know, uh, acknowledge that, and acknowledge an authority, acknowledge an, a power that exists, and to put ourselves in subjection to that authority, it causes you to be humble. It, will, it, will, it, it needs, it's necessary to be humble and to have humility. Look with me at Deuteronomy chapter number 31, verse number 27. The Bible says this, For I know thy rebellion, and now watch this, and thy stiff neck. Now what does it mean to be, have a stiff neck? It's a person that is, number one, proud. But it's also a person that is stubborn, isn't it? So it's, it's a proud type of attitude. That's what a, a rebellious person would be, a person that is proud. That is a stiff-necked person. And he says, Behold, while I am yet alive with you this day, ye have been rebellious against the Lord. And how much more after my death. That's actually the very first time that the word rebellion occurs in your Bible. And notice that it's used right there in tandem with a person that is stiff-necked. He refers to him as being rebellious or, or he knows his rebellion and he says that he is, he says, and thy stiff neck. A rebellious person is a proud person. As we, as we as Christians are called to be humble. We should have the exact opposite attitude towards God. We should not be rebellious towards God's commands. We should not rebel against His authority and His power. We should acknowledge His authority. We should acknowledge His power. And we should humble ourselves and be in subjection to His authority. Now, I'm gonna, I have uh, a conclusion here, two-part conclusion. It's only going to take me just a moment to get through it. We're actually going to be done here in just two, three minutes. Number one... I want to give you what should be our response to God's authority. What is the right response to God's authority? And I have four things, four things here. Number one, the first thing that we as Christians should do is acknowledge His power. We need to understand, as it says, all is thine. That's in heaven and in earth. Everything is His. We need to acknowledge His power, acknowledge His authority, and then as a result, submit to His authority and submit to his power. Number two, we need to familiar, familiarize ourselves. Man, I'm having trouble talking tonight. Familiarize ourselves with his laws. We need to understand and know his laws. God has a law book. You know, the first five books of the Bible are actually called the law, the book of the law. The Bible itself refers to it as the book of the law. We need to be familiar with God's laws. We need to know what his laws are. That's what we're going to find, you know, what we need to be obedient to. If we're going to submit ourselves to his authority, you can't just have, you know, just this flippant attitude of just, yeah, I, I'm obeying God, but then just continue on with your life. You need to be diligent, take another step, and find out what you actually need to obey. Look, search out in the book of the Lord and see what the commandments are and then obey them. And that is the step number three. We need to follow them. Once we're familiar with them, we need to follow them. We need to begin to obey God's commandments and keep God's commandments. And then number four is this. We need to teach others to follow His commandments as well. Once we are familiar with and we are keeping God's commandments, we need to teach others to take these steps as well in their lives. We need to acknowledge God's authority. We need to humble our heart. We need to uh, uh, you know, be, be humble, acknowledge His power. Number two, we need to familiarize ourselves with His laws and rules. And number three, we need to follow them. We need to begin implementing these laws in our lives. Number four, we need to teach others to follow His commandments as well. And then here is the last part of the conclusion. Why be obedient? Why should we be obedient? The obvious answer, number one, is because it's the right thing to do. And a person may respond with, well, why is it the right thing to do? And it's because He is the Lord. Because He is God. Because He rightfully possesses all authority and all power. If anyone deserves obedience, it is God, the creator of the earth. If anyone deserves and, and, and should receive obedience, and you should acknowledge anyone's authority, it should be the source of all power. The source of all authority. That's why, because He is God, because He is. Why do you obey any authority? Because it's, if it's legitimate, it's the only time you should ever obey it, right? 
That's the reason why. Well, he is the creator. Everything comes from him. Everything, he gave everything what it has. There would be nothing if it wasn't for him. There's no person that could say, hey, I gave you this, God. No one. Anything that you have, it came ultimately from him. He's the source of all. You know why you should? Simple answer. He's the God of gods and King of kings and Lord of lords. That's why. Because he has all, the pow all power and all authority. That's why. It's a very simple answer when we stop. He intrinsically deserves authority. Because he is the God of gods and King of kings. There's your answer. It's a very simple answer. Number two, why be obedient? I'll give you another reason. Because we love God. You should love God. And you should obey God because you love him. John chapter number 14 verse number 15 says this. If ye love me, keep my commandments. You should keep God's commandments because you love him. Number one, because he's God. That's why. He is the ruler. Number two, because you love him. You should actually keep his commandments, not only just because he's God, but keep his commandments because you love him. Because you want to express to him and show him that you love him. Number three, why be obedient? Because keeping God's commandments inherently brings peace and blessings in our lives. We see the great order that the universe has. And if you desire order in your life, if you desire your life not to be hectic and falling apart, having problems here, problems there, flaws here, faults there, keep God's commandments. We look at the natural world and it works perfectly, doesn't it? How everything operates, all of the laws, does gravity sometimes work and sometimes not? It's perfect, right? You look at all of the laws, law of, you know, first law of thermodynamics, second law of thermodynamics, there are all different types of laws. And, and you know what these laws do? They keep order. And God gave us free will. You know, the, the natural world has no choice. They are 100% in subjection and will always be to God's law. You know, the inanimate objects that is. Right? But we have free will and we can choose whether we're going to walk in God's commandments and keep His laws and be subject and, and put ourselves into subjection to His authority. And you know what the outcome would be if we would, were able to do it perfectly? You'd have great order in your life. You'd have great blessings and peace in your life. You know what order brings? It brings peace. It brings blessings. Isaiah chapter number 48 verse number 18 says this. All that thou hast hearkened to my commandments. This is God speaking. All that thou hast hearkened to my commandments. Then he says this. Then had thy peace been as a river and thy righteousness as the waves of the sea. So notice that. If you desire peace in your life, then you need to keep God's commandments. I want you to go back with me to 1 Chronicles chapter number 29, verse number 11. We're going to end there. And we need to keep this in mind as we're going through this series. That's why this was the perfect introduction. And that is that God is the head of all. Every authority that we look at, there are legitimate authorities. There are, there are many different authorities that God has ordained. They're only legitimate if God ordains them. And there are different systems of authority, different institutions that God has implemented. But one thing that we need to recognize is that God is the head above all of them. Look at 1 Chronicles chapter number 29, verse number 11. <clears throat> Thine, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. For all that is in the heaven and in the earth is thine. Thine is the kingdom, O Lord, and thou art exalted as head above all. Verse 12. Both riches and honor come of thee, and thou, look at this, reignest over all. And in thine hand is power and might, and in thine hand is, it is to make great and to give strength unto all. Now, therefore, our God, Watch this. We thank thee and praise thy glorious name. We need to praise God because he deserves it. We need to obey God because he deserves it. Amen. Why obey God? Because he's God. Tonight, the, the title of the sermon this evening was the Lord of Lords. So we're going to look at going forward in the evening services we're going to be looking at in the other parts of this series other authorities that exist, other lords or other rulers, if you will. But one thing to keep in mind, when we go to begin each night's service, I want you to remember that there is a Lord of all of these lords, that there is a God above all of these gods, and it is the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.
Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you, dear Lord. We're thankful that you are the Lord of lords and you are the God of gods. Now we have a great God, a powerful God, a mighty God, a God that doesn't grow weary, a God that doesn't lose his strength and doesn't grow weak, but he's, he's consistent, he's strong, and he remains the same. We're so thankful, dear Lord, that you are God. We're thankful that we have the Bible, uh, the, the, the power of your word. We ask you that you'd be with us uh, as we study your word here as a church. I ask you that you'd give me the ability to explain it and to expose it correctly, give me clarity of mind. I ask you that you would uh, help everyone to be attentive and to learn and to be diligent. Help us all to love your word. Help us to, uh, to be a good church that's pleasing unto you. Help us to grow. Help us to reach many people. Uh, be with us as we, as we go out soul winning, dear Lord, these next couple of months. And help us to meet our goal, dear God. And to be with us and help us to get many people saved. And to care about each person and not just to focus on the numbers either. And in Jesus Christ's name, amen.